This is on assignment. Hey everyone, I'm Alex Villarreal here with Imran Siddiqui and we're taking you on assignment. We'll talk to VOA's religion reporter about life in Cuba and what really went on during the Pope's recent visit. One of our economic reporters joins us to talk about changes at the World Bank. You'll hear from VOA's Tibetan service chief on the fight to free a filmmaker imprisoned by China. And later, a VOA online project creating a community of conversation around the Middle East. These are the stories behind the stories, so let's go on assignment. It was a historic visit. Pope Benedict traveled to Cuba last month, marking his first official trip to the communist-run island. VOA religion reporter Jerome Sakalovsky and news photographer Mike Corneli were there for what was also their first official visit. Let's take a look at their report. In his homily, the pontiff spoke of his joy at the recent increase in freedom given to the Roman Catholic Church in Cuba. But he also referred to the isolation of a country that has been under a U.S. embargo for the past 50 years. Cuba and the world need change, but this will occur only if each one is in a position to seek the truth and chooses the way of love, sowing reconciliation and fraternity. Before arriving in Cuba, Benedict called on the government to recognize that Marxism, in his words, no longer corresponds to reality. Marxist revolutionary heroes Ernesto Che Guevara and Camilo Cienfuegos looked over their shoulders as they prayed to God. It was hot, even for Cubans, and it was hard to see from so far away. But it was still meaningful for Clara Martinez. Having the Pope in Cuba is very important for religious people. I think it's an unforgettable experience and may be the last time. So the Pope's message on his visit was calling for freedom and openness, but you talked to some dissidents who said that sort of the opposite was occurring. Right, we met a group of dissidents who uh, talked about having been arrested or being kept at home with uh, police outside so they couldn't leave their homes. Uh, many said that their cell phone service was cut off, and they said um, that this was uh, a campaign, a, a an effort by the government to silence them during the Pope's visit, and that did contradict with, with his message. I heard the car start moving with an incredible speed, and when it turned like this, they grabbed me and shoved me inside. Meeting in the shaded garden of one of their houses, these dissidents share what happened to them while Pope Benedict XVI held mass in Cuban cities and met with Fidel Castro. And Ioanni Sanchez wants to hear it all. Sanchez publishes a blog called Generation Y. My blog doesn't draw on political or academic analysis. It's about the feelings, impressions and observations that I draw from my daily life. But those reflections have been deemed counter-revolutionary by Cuban authorities. Her blog was blocked in Cuba until last year, and Sanchez says she suffered retaliation. During the Pope's visit, some of these young Cubans were taken to jail, others were put under house arrest, and many of their cell phones did not work. But one thing they're convinced of is that the future of Cuba is in their hands. You've covered stories all over the world, but what was unique about shooting in Cuba? You know what strikes me right off the bat is when you go somewhere, where there's not a lot of advertising. And you ride around and the only billboards you see are the occasional billboards that will say mas socialism or something like that, a political billboard. And there aren't the level of commercialization of stores and signs and businesses that you see here. And that's striking. And then the other thing is that it really, okay, so we only saw a minute fraction of, the, of life there in the week that we were there. But it still strikes me that there was not a great deal of disparity of wealth and, and poverty. It seemed that everybody was pretty much in the middle. At least everyone we saw. So, so, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I remember before I went uh, 
looking at some reports uh, that have been done from Cuba previously and see, you see the, the, the Cadillac Fleetwoods from 19, the 1950s or the old American cars. That, and I thought there are maybe like three or four of those driving around Havana and that's what everybody films. But you get there and they're everywhere. You just stand on any street corner and they're passing all the time. There are other cars too. There are some, some new cars and a lot of like Russian made Ladas and Škodas. But yeah, it's everywhere. There is that, and then there is something um, very nice about Cuba and, and Cubans. They're very demonstrative. They're very expressive of their feelings. They're fairly open, and most people hardly suspicious of a camera at all. They were and, willing to talk to you, share their stories. Willing to talk. Yeah. Mm, talking's a little bit different, but uh, they may. They were perfectly happy to be photographed all the time. And that was Mike Cornelli and Jerome Sokolowski talking about their recent trip to Cuba. It's time now for a break. Coming up, we'll introduce you to the new president of the World Bank. You're watching On Assignment. Border Crossings is on the air. From Thanks the OA Music Mix. When I come in in the morning, I'll go to my um, computer and I'll check our email to see what requests have come in over the night. This is how we start the show. This one is from Rwanda. His request is for If I Had You by Anna, Adam Lambert. I'm looking up Adam Listening Lambert to Adam Adam Lambert singing. by request for Kumator Abo, who is joining us in Rwanda. This will be cut 12 in CD1. Cut 12. My role is director of Border Crossing, so I make sure everything flows in the studio as the show is happening okay. live. We might have to add a Beatles tune at the end. We're just a little bit short. Okay, perfect. I don't and even what know do what's do? on the show until Larry brings the bucket, like tomorrow's. He'll bring today's and place it in front of me. It's totally an unscripted show. This is Border Crossings. I'm in the process of getting the songs ready that I'm going to be playing on today's show. You've held your breath, she and now you can risks. exhale. Just it is a party stuff. town, and if you've ever been to party town... <laughs> I'm Larry London on the Border Crossings. Good morning, Border Crossings. What is your name, sir? I take phone requests. I go to the studio every day. Wolfer, I get calls okay, well, from everywhere, from China, just, you know, all over. Lee's great to work with. He's got experience in broadcasting as a DJ. He used to host his own radio show. I've put together some uh, language service IDs where I've used so the resources of VOA to go around to the different language services, and they make great segues between songs. Social Permissio Border Crossings, Uji. In London and Border Crossings, we're going to tomorrow right here on The Voice of America. Have a great day, and I'll see you in 23 hours. The new head of the World Bank is global health expert Jim Yong Kim, a doctor from the United States who President Obama says he is confident will be an inclusive leader of the top development lender. VOA's Jim Randall is here to tell us more. Jim, with Dr. Kim, what is it that he brings to this position that makes him different from those who came before him? He's the first doctor. He's the first uh, Asian American. Um, he is. Uh, most of the previous uh, heads have been higher level diplomats, foreign policy experts, business experts, those, those kinds of people. Um, he's different. Uh, as a doctor, he's been in the third world. He's been in uh, Peru and Haiti and, and all over Africa doing work on uh, multiple drug resistant uh, TB. Uh, it's very difficult to come up with a way of treating this terrible disease in a place where even drinking the water can make you ill. He's worked around that and he's made it, he's figured out ways to make those things work. He headed the, the UN effort to fight AIDS. And so he has some real world nitty gritty on the ground um, experience in, in, in one of the key areas of development. Now the, the critique of him from some of his other people is that the fundamental purpose of the World Bank is to increase global growth so that you can pay for better health care and schools and infrastructure and so on. So it'll be interesting to see if he's able to do that. Well, we'll definitely be following him closely. Let's take a look now at Jim's profile of Dr. Jim Young Kim, the newest president of the World Bank. 
in all the problems that I've taken on, I haven't come at it from a purely philosophical or political perspective. And on one level, I'm a very practically oriented physician that's trying to solve problems so that people can live. In a preview of his approach at the World Bank, Dr. Kim analyzes the U.S. healthcare system, urges officials to focus on data and results, and calls for a new approach. It's getting so bad that we think that finally there will be enough pressure so that we have to act. Unfortunately, for about the last 20 years, we've been saying that. Critics say the World Bank deals with far more than just health care, and they question whether Dr. Kim has enough experience to boost global growth to pay for improved health care, education, and infrastructure. One economist says the president of the World Bank needs to change its feudal culture and focus on core economic issues. But Anders Asland of the Peterson Institute for International Economics also says Dr. Kim's experience running a college may be helpful. Because there you also have people that you can't sack, institutions that you can't uh, uh, do away with uh, uh, very easily. Officials passed over Nigeria's highly regarded finance minister to pick Dr. Okay, Kim. Ngozi Okonjo Iwala says her years of work at the bank and life it. experience would have made her a strong leader for the world's largest development institution. It's not good enough to say you know about poverty. You have to live it to know what it means, and I did. So Jim, part of your piece that we didn't get to see was this lighter side to Dr. Kim. Tell us about that. He has to be the first World Bank president in history who is uh, reasonably good at rapping and, uh, and, and dancing. I mean, he was in a student uh, uh, musical production. He played a comic role and the kids loved it. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jim. It's time now for another break. Coming up, we look at one woman's fight to free her husband. You're watching On Assignment. VOA Special English, a way to learn American English and much more. Broadcasting news and features around the world on radio, television, and on the web at voaspecialenglish.com. For 50 years, helping people understand world events and the language and culture of America. The Voice of America is offering online English lessons. The Classroom is Voice of America's new online English classroom. From the VOA homepage, click on Learning English, and then click on the classroom to start learning English. In the classroom, you will find current news articles with customized English language lessons, English language activities for beginning, intermediate, and advanced English speakers, interactive workbooks and dictionaries under the Interactive Learning tab, and English programs showing you how English is really spoken and English lessons available for teachers all over the world to use in their classrooms. Learn English with Voice of America. Click on the classroom to start learning English today. to the self-immolation protests and tensions in China's Tibetan regions. As China steps up efforts to silence dissent, activists are trying to draw attention to the Tibetans' cause. Yeah, one of those speaking out is the wife of imprisoned Tibetan filmmaker Danda Wangchen. On assignments, Philip Alexio talks to Lo San Gatso, head of VOA's Tibetan service, about Wangchen, who's been in police custody now for more than four years. Donda Wangchen's troubles began four years ago while producing a film about Tibetan concerns about life in China. Chinese authorities saw the documentary as a threat to Chinese rule. Wangchen shot leaving fear behind in the run-up to the Beijing Olympics and was later sentenced to six years in prison. 
Lamo Tsol has been trying to raise international awareness of her husband's case for several years. She spoke recently at a rally in New York and expressed fears to VOA about her husband's health. It's been five years since I've seen him. I've not heard his voice since March 17, 2008. What is in this film, in this documentary, that is so controversial, at least from China's point of view? There's actually nothing controversial about it. But it's in the context of Tibet and China, which, um, and you have to remember also that the film was made in 2008. In the spring of 2008, uh, saw the largest sweeping protests throughout Tibet since 1950s, 1959. Uh, over 150 mass protests throughout Tibet, asking for greater freedoms, uh, demanding for the return of the Dalai Lama, and for greater religious and cultural freedoms. You have to also remember that the Olympics are coming up towards the end of the year in 2008. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Tundub Wanchen had this insight, uh, this very, very simple insight, because China has repeatedly been saying that the case of Tibet cannot be represented by exiled Tibetans or the Dalai Lamas or any Western nations and NGOs and human rights organizations because Tibetans are happy inside Tibet, inside Tibet and inside China. I think Tundub had this insight. He'll just go speak to farmers and nomads and business people around Tibet. He'll just ask them, are you happy? What do you think about the Olympics? What do you think about the Dalai Lama? What do you want and what's missing? So, and so these people are basically, and if you watch the film, it's, it's just remarkable. You just see people in their environment, in their houses, in the, out in the fields, at their farms, just saying they are not happy, they're extremely oppressed. Ladies and gentlemen, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyatso. They want the return of the Dalai Lama to Tibet and the environment, political situation in Tibet to change so that he can return, going to the people, and this is what's so controversial for the, for the Chinese. What uh, does a reporter, a correspondent, journalist uh, go through when they might go to Tibet and report on any particular story? The two of the most dramatic protests that happen inside Tibet happened during organized press tours by the Chinese authorities. One inside the holiest Tibetan temple in Lhasa in 2008, and one at a monastery a thousand kilometers away, and, it, and the protests erupted in front of the cameras. Uh, so Tibetan areas, especially areas of unrest inside Tibet, are completely banned for reporters. This is actually in, um, uh, is not in keeping with uh, the Chinese authorities' promises to uh, foreign correspondents inside China uh, during the Olympics, the, uh, that uh, correspondents are supposed to be able to travel to any part of China uh, given uh, prior notice to do interviews and to, to speak with people. But it's not possible inside Tibet, yeah. Who contacted who for this story? Well, we've known of Lama Tso's presence in exile. We, we've known, obviously, of Tundu Wanchen's film for, for the last several years. So. This year, uh, she's been able to, she's been invited by various groups in Europe and here in the States to uh, come and speak uh, uh, about her husband's project, about her husband's uh, situation now. And she was here in D.C. actually uh, testifying uh, on the Hill. While she's out campaigning and her husband is, uh, is imprisoned, can that make things worse for her husband? Well, this is exactly, we asked her this, uh, and we have this dilemma every time we bring up an issue of a political prisoner, are we helping or hurting the case of the person in, in detention? In her feeling, she's, she's made up her mind. Uh, first of all, I mean, when she um, was in exile already, then the film came out, uh, and uh, the people who were working to release the film showed it to her, and they actually gave her the choice, shall we release it or not? And it was a very difficult decision for her, obviously, but her husband was already in detention. And she basically said, this is what her husband believed in and wanted to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and she really felt like she had no choice but to release the film. Losen Gatzer, the head of BOA's Tibetan service, uh, thanks a lot for talking You're with welcome. us. It's not uncommon for international media to focus on what's wrong with the Middle East instead of what's working. So say the creators of a VOA project designed to give a voice to the voiceless. The project is called Middle East Voices. Its goal, 
to allow collaborative journalism and people within the region to redefine how their stories are told. Imran spoke with VOA's Davin Hutchins and Cecily Hillary about the online project and its genesis. We thought that the Arab Spring deserved its own website because it was about a conversation. It's about a yearning in, in five or six different countries. And just informing them what's happening in the Arab Spring wasn't as important as listening to what they were aspiring to, the things that they wanted to change. So we wanted to build a website that, A, was dedicated to that conversation. It's really a, a listening platform as well as an amplification platform, and there's good journalism on it as well. What is a typical day like for you guys? We'd be surprised. <laughs> the team is not that long. Uh, there's about a dozen of us. We're divided into uh, a few teams. So the blogging team, which are people who basically write uh, script and text and curate, uh, meet every morning and we basically look at trends, what's trending on Google, what's trending on Twitter, what other people are writing about. And we kind of say like, what should we do? Raise us in the rankings of where we show up on the search results. It's more likely people are gonna click on us versus go to page. Did you see the little girl that stood out yesterday in the streets of Damascus with a big sign right in the middle of traffic? And people just stood there and clapped. She did get arrested. Authorization and what certain countries would respond to and what they wouldn't respond to, and then we fight, and then eventually <laughs> we come up with something. But tell me something, everyone is using social media these days. What makes your project different? We call for engagement. We, we invite people to offer their viewpoints and, and start up a dialogue. I think that's what makes us very different. So for example, if you create some sort of online debate, Sometimes Middle East voices are the referee in there and what we're doing is saying, okay, we're going to talk about whether you support Bashar al-Assad or don't support him. We're going to be neutral and we're going to try to keep things fair. And so when you're talking about what you're doing, how you're refing, the things you're interested in, in an open Twitter, Facebook, or website environment, people see that. And if you're human behind the website, and if you're human behind all of these things, they actually, we get praise a lot of times saying, hey, you guys handled that debate well, or your coverage is more balanced than I thought. If I were to ask you, how do you cover a live event? And you have something going on, uh, which is Bahrain Lulu Live. Mm. Is that uh, the way you cover your live event, or is that the portal where people can go and watch your live event? With Lulu Live, we had people on the ground feeding us information. Bahrainis do have a strong presence on Twitter, unlike uh, Syrians and some other groups. So what you're saying is that uh, people in Bahrain are more internet savvy okay. compared to other parts Greater of the Middle East. internet penetration. Yeah, I mean, so. to a crazy degree. But we actually <laughs> did some data mining and found out that like normal people, doctors and stuff, have like 10, 12,000 Twitter followers. So basically everybody in the country is following you and you're following everybody in the country. They're also on iPhones two to one according to our data, which means they are using mobile far more than PCs. And so everything we've done in Bahrain, when we covered the original protest when they began, and then this Lulu Live was for the anniversary of protests, um, what you see are people immediately have this literacy on how to participate. And it just takes a, a little bit of asking a question or a conversation to get sometimes thousands of people to respond. Yeah. We've had, uh, we had one post where um, somebody wrote an open letter to uh, U.S. Congress saying that not all Bahrainis agree with the pro-democracy activists. We had, I think, 30,000 visits in two days, and the poll, we said, do you agree with this letter, had more than 10,000 votes. So we wanted to give you a fair idea of what we do when we do a day of story for Middle East Voices and trying to get um, uh, our audience, our core audiences, to talk back to us. Uh, Bahraini government is being criticized for being a, a major human rights violator. What we try to do is to talk about a conversation already happening, give it some context, amplify it a bit, and then continue that conversation. So yeah, also included a, um, an open letter that was penned by uh, various rights organizations. The final post will look like this. Our headline is World Criticism of Bahrain Mounts, but is it fair? Uh, and then what you have is usually we'll have a poll that's very clear. We want to get the conversation going with the Bahrainis. We have the different uh, condemnation coming out from the different groups, Amnesty International here, uh, the open letter Erie mentioned. And we're going to add some hashtags. So for example, we would add Bahr World Criticism Bahrain Intensifies, but is it fair? That's the question. We might want to add like vote now since there's a poll. And the tweet goes. We go over to our real real-time analytics. That's the traffic on the site right now. Let's go ahead and take the uh, 
the same story. I'm going to put it into our Facebook page, which has about 7,000 people. We also use Google Plus. So we'll go to Google Plus and ask the same question. I think the future of journalism and public diplomacy are, are both going to be focusing around just how much are, is your audience convinced that you are paying attention to what they want yeah. and not how much you know they should be paying attention to you. That was VOA's Davin Hutchins and Cecily Hillary talking about VOA's Middle East Voices project. You can check it out anytime at MiddleEastVoices.com. And now in our full story feature, VOA's Kane Farabaugh explains why an electric powered car, which is my personal favorite, but this one's by General Motors, is actually having more success in Europe than in the United States. Let's check it out. When General Motors unveiled its electric powered Volt in 2007, the automaker promised a car of the future today. But since the Volt went on the market last year, sales in the United States are underwhelming. I knew the technology would uh, take slowly in the public. Right there, standard 110. General Motors vehicle line executive Jim Federico says despite missing a sales target of 10,000 vehicles last year, he is not disappointed. There's still a lot of learning to the public what it's all about. The more people that buy them, the more they tell others, and the better it does. But selling uh, 8,000 year one, I'm quite pleased. Volt sales dipped after federal investigators focused on possible post-accident fires in the car's battery compartment. But they closed the case earlier this year, finding no defects. Popular Mechanics Magazine automotive editor Larry Webster says GM set the Volt sales targets too high, particularly given its price. He spoke to VOA via Skype. I mean, it's $40,000, and essentially you get the same size car as something that costs $20,000. But customers are warming to the Volt's European cousin, the Opel Ampera. Almost identical to the Volt, the Ampera went on sale in Europe in February. So far, GM has received about 7,000 orders. GM's Jim Federico says the car's initial price has to be higher to help pay for the new technology. He says the more Volts that sell, the lower the price becomes. So it is our best shot to bring in uh, the true buyers that are after this and willing to pay for it. As we continue to evolve the vehicle and develop it every year, we will continue to get cost out of the car and be able to realign the price. Popular mechanics Larry Webster says the bigger challenge in marketing other electric vehicles is changing the automotive culture in the U.S., where long distance driving is common. The Volt can go about 75 kilometers on a charge. I think in this country we value our ability to travel freely and electric vehicles certainly curtail that. But gas guzzling vehicles are becoming less appealing to U.S. drivers as gas prices soar above $4 a gallon. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Detroit, Michigan. And that does it for this week's episode of On Assignment. Join us again next week when we look at the work of a VOA journalist online in Moscow. And you can visit us anytime on Facebook and at Twitter at VOA On Assignment. And our episodes are also on the program tab at VOAnews.com. Until next time, from all of us at On Assignment, thanks for watching.